We're joined today by Sharon Love. Sharon is uh, works for Omnicom, which is one of the largest marketing services holding companies in the world. About $15 billion in revenue, 75,000 employees. Sharon is the executive chairperson of Omnicom's commerce group, a number of agencies in that practice discipline. And prior to this role, she was uh, worked at, at TPN, one of the agencies in that group where she was um, the CEO for 23 of the 35 years that she worked there. Sharon is really one of the most blue flame thinkers we've come across on the topic of culture. And she's really applied her thinking at TPN when she was um, uh, associated with that particular agency. And she created something called TPN Soul, which is essentially the cultural manifesto of that agency and really credited with helping to fuel the success of that agency. And so Sharon really represents uh, both a CEO and somebody who practices culture as a strategic lever. So welcome and thank you so much, oh, Sharon. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. What a nice yeah. introduction. I sound old with that with that lineup. <laughs> no, no. So um, maybe just to start, you know, culture is one of those words that is pretty broad. It can be sort of amorphous um, for people, hard to get your arms around. How do you define culture? What 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 do you think makes up culture? Well, I, you're right. It's it, it's big, and I think first I would say you kind of need to qualify culture. There's good, productive, um, positive cultures, and then there's toxic cultures. And or said another way, I guess if in the absence of a positive culture, things can get toxic. So I think for the purposes of our conversation today, to keep it simple, I'm just going to only be talking about positive culture. And thank you for the introduction explaining uh, my role. I've only been the executive chairperson for three and a half months. So my whole life up to that point was TPN, um, 23 years as a CEO, and then another 12 or so um, as a not CEO, <laughs> as a member of the group. And um, I'm speaking today about my experiences at TPN and building the culture, as you, as you um, explained. And I did get the permission of the current brilliant CEO of TPN to make sure that she was fine with it. And she was thrilled and said she can't wait to watch the video. So good. Understood. So culture. Well, I think um, it for me, it's pretty simple. It's people and it's people who share common values and common beliefs and attitudes about how to exist together, working together. Um, to do um, to do to do great work, to do something together, but definitely to do great work. And I, I think the culture of a business is how it, it affects how people see and define uh, where they work. So it's good speak for me. So how did culture become something you were interested in and and so committed to? Did you always just have a sort of a natural appreciation for the dynamics of culture, or or was there some? event or experience that really triggered your appreciation of it? Well, I um, was very lucky to join a company that had a very good culture already established. It was very small. I was the 11th employee. Um, the founder had come from the client side and he started the agency, um, in his words back then, sort of to fix the the right to right the wrongs of his experience in, in corporate America on the client side. So he created this environment um, in the agency. This was before I joined. So I came into it. And so I would say we didn't talk about culture. We didn't, I didn't maybe know what it was. I just knew the experience of it was great. I loved where I worked. So it was sort of started that simply. And then as I obviously as I matured and became a leader myself, it was very clear in seeing the world around me that what we had at TPN was very, very special and very unique. And then it became part of my responsibility to nurture it and to help it grow and to continue making sure that this was, um, it continued to be a part of what made the agency such a great place to be. Um, so I, I definitely appreciated it. Uh, I said through my whole career at TPN, um, I'm quoted often by saying, uh, I work here too, because I wanted to show up at work every day like everyone else and be glad I was there, feel great about being there so I could do my best work. And um, so I guess that was kind of my first introduction. I landed in it, loved it, and then tried to keep it going. Hmm. 
So it's really interesting. You say, you know, when you started, you didn't, you guys didn't really talk about culture. It was something that you experienced, which I think is so true. But then it sounds as though, was it really as you became, as you were more in a leadership role that you started to think about this more intentionally or what is this and, and kind of managing it. It seemed like maybe, you know, there's some distinction there of going from just experience, right place to work to like, oh, this is this thing. And do you think that's particularly a role of a leader? I think it's a particularly a role of a leader to be intentional about it, intentional about setting it. Managing maybe make that word probably makes me a little uncomfortable because it's not really something you manage. It's something you inspire. And mm -hmm. it needs to be very inculcated and very embedded in the people. Um, and it needs to be there. They need to be living it and it's got to be authentic. And so I think managing sounds, it's the wrong notion, but intentional is exactly right because it's not, you, it doesn't just happen. Um, it, it's sort of, you, it's, you set it and then you embed it and you live it as leaders. You have to model it. And then you st it starts to almost, um, it, it's almost self-selects, if you will. Um, and in some ways it self-rejects because if you join a company with a culture that you don't fit into or you don't agree with or you doesn't work for you, you won't want to stay. Um, so sometimes that culture meant, uh, that culture created something that, that, that we would have to maybe ask someone to not stay at the agency because they didn't um, share our values. Um, and sometimes people just self-select out because it's just not where they want to be. So Yeah. Okay. So I think it would be great to kind of get into the TPN soul because that is it's such a concrete way of talking about the topic. Um, and maybe you could just briefly describe TPN Soul, and then I'd love to get into like how did you guys come up with that? What was the process? But could you just describe TPN Soul? Yeah, um, I love to talk about TPN Soul, uh, and I should start by saying I I didn't create it; we created it, and I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, but the tenets of um, TPN Soul, which are respect, empathy, collaboration, drive, and curiosity were existed within the agency. These were these were descriptors of the kinds of values that the agency was operating under before we codified it and sort of tried to put that magic in a bottle so that we could talk about it, give it a name, et cetera. So we the the tenets of it existed and one of our colleagues um, twenty years ago attended uh, Omnicom University, um, SMP, which is senior management program. It's a fabulous executive education um, program I could talk about for two hours as well. And one of the things you do when you leave that first year is you bring an initiative back to your agency, something that you were inspired by during the program that you think could help your agency. So our colleague came back and that was the initiative. Let's, how do we capture this magic in a bottle? How do we name it? What, how do we talk about it? So we treated it like a brief, like a client brief. Um, what makes TPN TPN? And we expected that this was going to be a rather, it's personal, it's, there's lots of different opinions. There was people from young to old, new, new to the agency and, and more tenured. And we thought it, we didn't think it was going to be easy. Um, it was easy <laughs> because it existed. So what it was was just finding the language for something that already, um, that already existed. So we did it, and um, and that's where we landed. So it, it, it's a value system, it's an ethos, it's a roadmap, uh, it's a blueprint, uh, it's how the agency hires and fires if you're meeting the values, if you're not meeting the values. It's how we show up for ourselves, it's how we show up for clients, and very importantly, it's infused into the work we do for clients. Uh, and so it has a long uh, tail of value uh, across the agency. Yeah, so that's interesting that um, your exercise was really about capturing what existed, um, which probably is the case very often, as opposed to you guys feeling like there's a bunch of what exists that we need to keep 
and then there's maybe some new a new value we need to inject or something that we need to evolve but this was it's almost like positioning a brand sometimes it's just bringing out what is yeah. and other times it has to change it but but you guys were starting with the place that you felt really Correct. And I, I think when you when you think about um, you couldn't go into a to a business, any business that didn't have that some of that existing and put this over it, because then it is just words and then it is just a construct versus this was just giving voice to uh, behaviors and 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 values that were already existing. So you're right. It, it made it easier. I will say, though. When you put a value like res uh, like respect into a into an ethos into a value system, it there is a um, it's always asking more of you. It's always it's always asking you to recheck yourself. So to some degree, there be there was there was aspiration, just because we ch we chose descriptors and and values for our behavior that was going to always keep us um, in 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 check. I guess would be able to say it. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Well articulated set of values captures what is what you're doing, but it does because you've articulated them always yeah. demand more yeah. because you have to live up to them. So one of the things also I thought was really kind of role modelish of TPN Soul. You mentioned behaviors. Is that you didn't just lay out these five values curiosity empathy collaboration but but you then articulated for each one a number of very specific behaviors like um for respect you say this is how you live it okay well you have to value your and others time by being on time you should be an active listener you should debate and negotiate versus argue so you got the value to pretty specific behaviors that I think you could say, okay, I get that. And could I see it? Could I practice it? How did you negotiate and get to the, were those also things that already existed or did you have to do more to kind of get to that level of translation? Yeah, I, th that's a, it's a great question. Some of them existed. Some of them might've just been my pet peeves, like being late. Uh, but it's the thing we were really cautioning ourselves on was this was not meant to be uh, a book of manners or or a you know um, some sort of like, man, like manners class. It was meant to be true a true value system, but that was understandable, was relatable. We 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 made sure that no one in TPN could say they didn't understand what we meant by it. So that's why we took it down to real examples. And time is an interesting one because yes, it's disrespectful to be late. Um, that's just a human truth, but it's also very business disruptive. And, and that's the piece about these, these tenants that all, while they sound, um, some of them sound very personal and, and maybe not so business focused. The disrespect of being late is, is, has a domino effect on an entire day and not just your own. It affects others. It, it, and a business from being as agile and as effective as it needs to be for clients. And that business disruption has a cost to it. So there's, there's a lot of connectivity through this value system to just good business. And that was really what we set out to do. And we made the examples um, understandable for a person coming right out of college and joining the agency or someone who'd been here for 20, you know, 10 or 15 years. Is there an example... I don't know of one of these. I are the the value or behavior. I, sort of, what does it take once you articulate it to get it really embedded? Now, as you said, a lot of these existed, but were any of these? Was there something that really made it stick? Um, something things that you saw that um, we call them signals that oh, people see they're serious about this because. We can see this thing. Is there something about one of those values? I don't know. Just an example of how you really made these stick. I think it for one thing, the the five are kind of a box set, and so and they're kind of used as a box set. I mean, there you can tease them out a little bit, um, but I guess it, the red thread of respect is sort of running through all of them. That was we got when we sat down at the table to do this. We got to I said we got to respect very quickly, 
and the, the the real time in coming up with TV and Soul was figuring out the other four, because respect was too big, too broad, not granular, not specific. We understand it; everyone understands it differently. So we didn't want to let go of it, but then we wanted to bring it to life. So if you think about there is if without respect and collaboration, it's not collaborative. Without respect and curiosity, it is mm. you know. Without, I mean, so they they do so they sort of run through. Um, but I think there was there's probably a hundred ways that we that we saw it because we you know you start to talk about something like this you bring it to forth to the agency, and there was you know first you just see a lot of nodding heads yeah that's us that you know that's who we are and then we just started pushing it very gently into and it, and I say we I don't mean me necessarily the group, um, uh, a Monday morning staff meeting we would do um, we would uh, honor a colleague that had done something great the week before, and we called it Star of the Week, and talked about how what they did through the lens of through the aperture of tp and soul they showed empathy by doing this they showed collaboration by doing that and that was a weekly thing that that, that started and if you won star of the week you got to do host the staff meeting the next monday so there was a way to get notice there was acknowledgement there was um the reward of that kind of acknowledgement small but just sort of lots of small things that added up to creating this foundation that just got bigger and stronger and um I think probably the most profound, so, that, so that's a small thing, and the most profound uh, demonstration of TP and Soul was uh, during the pandemic. I mean, just sort of starting with how we handled the pandemic, I, would, I could talk about that, but specifically, not long into the pandemic, we will all remember, um, there was the murder of George Floyd, and it was atrocious and and devastating and maybe not maybe definitely made worse by the fact we were all locked at home so as the leader of the agency i had to figure out how to help an agency full of people that i care about um somehow heal from this or understand this or or just be able to deal with this in in some way so i because i had the confidence and the permission because of tp and soul i reached out to black leaders in the agency First, to see how they were doing, and secondly, to ask if they'd help me, because I was I was at a loss. I didn't really know what to do, to be very honest. And because of TP and Soul, those leaders had the permission and the courage to say, "Not yet. I will help you, but not yet." And just that exchange, it was just sort of the the launching point to what went on to be honest conversations. The weeks of the most profound weeks of my life, um, being able to have these conversations with these leaders talking about racism and white privilege and discrimination and all of these things through their stories and their um, experience. And I don't know that that could have happened in an environment that did not have this bedrock, that they knew they could speak to me honestly and and openly and that I would be an active listener and I would so everything was in place for that. And and I, I when I think back on how different that could have been, it, what ended up happening was I very quickly stepped to the back of the room, pretty much out of frame, while this group created an ERG, the first one at the first black ERG at TPN, called named ourselves Omni Black. Um, and they've gone on, went on to help the agency, help me help the agency metabolize this horror. And then quickly pivoted to what else can we do now that we've come together, now that we can talk, have these open conversations, what can we do with this power? And that pivoted into how can we help our clients? How Let's look at our clients and let's identify um, brands where um, the black population is underserved and how could we create programs that, that are more appropriate and more inspiring. And it's just, it's, it's taken off. So once again, the good of a system that took care of us, that wrapped its arms around us, has also led to business um, business success. Yeah. So that, that's such a great example of the, in that case, your values, the TPN soul being something more than just words. In other words, when you said you went to those leaders and they they understood within the context of your values, it was okay for them to say, like, not now. Um, so, so, so often, I think the values that organizations have 
many of them are kind of just platitudes. You know, they have these values and unclear if they really lived at like the level you just described that value, those values will live really, really specifically woven into behavior. How do you think, what, what is that differentiator? Like how, how do you suppose that your values got to that level? Or what is it that you think distinguishes when a value is just a platitude versus getting to that level of being able to um, influence people's behavior? Well, I think they have to be authentic and realistic to the to the group that they're being applied to. I mean, they have to, it's like the people reflect the values, the values reflect the people. So you couldn't, you couldn't have, inserted i don't know you we we just um as i said we because we use the ex existing um behaviors of and and values of the people that there was there was just that fit um i don't i don't know that i can i, I don't know I don't, I don't know if i can give a better answer to that because there was no um it, it it wasn't as i said before it can't be managed it can't be it can't be from over the top, it can't be forced, and it just has to be lived. And I think that's maybe the the big the biggest takeaway about it. It has to be modeled, and it has to be lived. And I think what maybe maybe part of that answer would be just as we as the agency got bigger, we were so small when it's, we started. We were almost like our own you know laboratory test for you know how this might work. Even though we didn't have culture as an assignment, it just was. As it got bigger, um, I, you, what I think you would see is when it when someone when the values weren't being applied or when someone was behaving in a way uh, that that was in in violation in in uh, to our to our value system so I think it was more um, identifying when it wasn't working versus doing anything specific to make it work yeah it's interesting because I think that I think you're right that it probably what really makes it work is that authenticity it just yeah. is authentic to the place and I think a lot of times you see, values get inserted or added where an organization feels like, well, we need this. We need to, we need to have more of this thing. And it gets added to a set of values that maybe is not really that authentic at the time to the organization. And I think people really struggle to get traction on those because they're intellectually right, but right. they just don't land authentically. And so nobody's really should do we really mean that well you know i think what helped us doug is so now we talk about culture all the time we're we're doing a, a conversation about culture it's on the cover of every you know the harvard business review and every other business magazine every other other magazine culture is something we talk about all the time and it's being examined and it's being now heralded as something to pay attention to and good for good for businesses that you know that do that when we TPN's 40 years old, and I've been a part of it for 35 years, and it was always important to us, and we were always doing things to protect it and to nurture it. But it, it wasn't something we didn't we didn't really talk about culture per se until we codified it into TPN Soul, and then once we got it set, then it was set, and then we just started making sure that not started. We just continued to be sure that we were living those those values. So. There may be something in that, in the, in the, you know, we never, I didn't have to try. I can't answer the question. What would it be like if n none of this was in place? And I tried five years ago to put this on top of the agency. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Was there any, <clears throat> ever any a time, ever a time when you felt like you had to evolve the culture there and TPN soul, or was it just, all the time you were there was sort of fit to purpose. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering if, if so, if, how do you know well, we need to do a little refresh? Right, right. right. Uh, well, I think about the values themselves are resolute. I mean, they are, they, they are what you don't, I don't think one should, or we didn't change the, the values, but how they are expressed and, and how they show up and how they manifest, how they, how we celebrate them changed nonstop because mm -hmm. the environment changed because the people changed. You know, one of the things I was thinking about, um, thinking about talking to you today is TPN has, we are a diverse agency and, and TPN is a, not we, TPN is a diverse agency. 
and not as diverse as we want to be. I mean, there's a lot of work still there to do, but we embrace and, and celebrate diversity. And one of the things within the agency is there are 24 year olds and there are people in their 50s. So there are at least two generations of, of people working side by side every day. So imagine how different the world looks to the aperture of a 25 year old versus a 50 year old. And so the values have to be expressed and be meaningful for all of those people. And as every generation, every new group of young people join the agency or people who come in for out from the outside from a different agency or join us from a different country or from a different whatever it might be, there can be new ways to think about, new, new facets to those five values that just add more strength and credibility and authenticity to what to what they mean. So it changes a lot in terms of um, grows and becomes bigger and more more faceted, but the values themselves don't change. And I would say you ask something about when do you know if it's a little um, if 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 you need to check in with it if if, if maybe it's not um, as healthy as it should be or it's always been a barometer um, the 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 health of the business the health of the culture they're so um, correlated and. And we'd find things like maybe we made a couple of hires that were people who didn't uh, didn't model our values. Maybe we let someone stay too long who was violating and 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 not respecting those values. Um, there's lots of different, and you you could you could pretty easily and pretty quickly put your finger on. And sometimes even people would come and say to to HR or to me or to whomever. I, that person is not d demonstrating TP and soul. Use the language themselves. So you know when it's being played back to you. I've had clients play it back to me. So then you know, wow, we've 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 created something here that is authentic and is real and is not just write a writing on a wall or a something in a handbook. It's um it's lit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing you said I thought was interesting, um, you have these five values, but you mentioned that one of them was seemed really sort of central, the one around respect. Um, and I was sort of curious, you know, a lot of times organizations have three to five, and um, I think sometimes it's hard for people to sort of process all those. And I've, I've often wondered, should those three to five thematically be part integrated it, it, one of them is more important i would so i wonder if you could just describe you know is it that respect was either the predominant value or it, it was sort of the weaving thing and so these aren't five distinct even though they're five very different words but actually you saw them as more of a i don't know a system or something like that how did how did you think about the five well i think Respect for sure is sort of found the foundational piece of it. And if you want to call it a red thread, that's probably fair too. As I say, as you pull it through the other values, they, without respect embedded in them, they're not a value, right? So, you know, uh, disrespectful collaboration is not good collaboration um, in the simplest terms. But I think, they, so they all, they do all in our, for me and for us, they do all fit together. Um, they're, they're, and they're really all around um, just human interaction and how you treat each other. Um, so that that's, I guess, the 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 way they're they're locked together. Um, and then we, and when you pull them apart, you can you know you can get. I I love curiosities. One I always talk about when I'm presenting this to the agency or even to a client about as a marketer, if we're not curious, we're not good at our jobs. That's our job. And it baked into curiosity is is data and research and strategy. And, you know, there, you can, you can pack in a lot of the business um, expressions of curiosity, but just a curious mind um, is one that's always seeking and always asking and always learning. So you can, you can take them apart and, and they can absolutely stand on their own, but respectful curiosity is, is, is important. Yeah. So you said something I thought also interesting that, these are all these, um, what struck me, the values that you have are all largely human centered, empathy, curiosity, respect, other than you have one that's drive. 
a lot of companies, I think, have more of sort of this balance. I don't know, like performance type values, like winning, accountability. Um, so you've kind of touched on this, but but how did you think about, or was that kind of a conscious um, architecture of your values are much more human centered than sort of performance or output centered? Correct. I've answered, I've had this question come at me in different ways since we established the, 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 the system, the value system. And I, to me, it's funny, just, I guess it's just how minds work, but I think of all five as performance values because we are in the business of affecting human behavior, human shopping behavior, understanding what makes people do what they do, understanding people and human beings. And so understanding and, and infusing our work with empathy and with uh, it, collaboration and with curiosity, those, those tenets are how we get to the great work, how we get to the great unlock of a campaign or an idea that is winning and selling. And so for me, what drive is the more obvious one. It's the more clear one. It is, it is winning. It is, it is all the things that you said at the beginning. And it's the one everyone understands, but it's, you have to just look at the other four through um, a slightly different lens to see that they are just as important to driving to success and driving to business success and, and culture success as, um, as drive. So to me, it's the same thing. They're the same thing. I have five performance values. Yeah. Okay. So that's how I guess you see the link. I, I think sometimes people have a hard time linking, you know, okay, what's the mechanism by which culture drives results? You know, I mean, I think people don't understand. I understand how strategy drives results. So I understand how planning and allocation of capital or budgets drives results. I even understand how talent drives results. How does culture drive results? So how do you think about that connection? Well, I guess I the way I the easiest way for me to think about it is to think about what would happen if you took culture away. Because some of this is some of it is a little bit it's it's not easy to quantify, which I think sometimes makes people uncomfortable. It's why it feels squishy and and too um too human and too like too human centric and not business enough. But as long as humans are doing business, culture is needed to get the best of them, to bring their, the best part of what they have to the table, the best strategy, the best uh, creative idea, the, the best, um, the best of, of people has to be, you've got to take care of the person. So I guess that's, I'm starting kind of very um, foundational in terms of the way that I believe culture um, contributes to, to, to business success. You think about things like tenure and turnover of both clients and staff and employees. If culture, if a good culture is not in place, um, a positive, productive culture is not in place, there will be lots of turnover. There will not. There will be very little consistency. There will be lots of business disruption. That's an, 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 a way that, that a positive culture can, can drive results just by creating that foundational strength of both the the agency and the and the relationship with the clients, it's um, there's a, a quote. I'm just trying to I'm trying to bring it back. Um, pleasure, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. In this Aristotle, now pleasure is a dumb word in terms of it, it's not the word I would use for to culture, but the idea that feeling good and about yourself, feeling good about where you are, feeling safe, feeling value, feeling seen is how you get to perfection. It's how you get to great work. And I think that's, um, that's would be my answer. Yeah. Good answer. Did you ever have cases where if you think about like alignment around your values, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of, there's some really good research I've seen that shows if a leadership team CEO and direct reports isn't aligned around the values, then, you know, that's, that's a first point of trouble. Did you, uh, without of course, getting any specifics ever have a period where you didn't have alignment with some senior leaders around the values and 
how did that show up and what did you what did you have to do about it? Or did you actually always have a sort of a filtering process by which that didn't happen? Um, I would say that the 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 tenets of, of uh, and the and the construct, the framework, if you will, of, of TP and Soul was a was a way for all of us to check ourselves and and, and each other. And so, if you had, of course, we had times when we weren't in alignment, and times when someone didn't agree with someone else, or times when people weren't their best selves, weren't behaving, and myself included. And you could use you could use a, you can use a value system in that way as a very constructive way to point out to someone, and especially as in leadership positions where it, it sometimes maybe it feels it's a little harder. They, they're not they're not in their learning stage of their career, right? So you're 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 telling a tenured person something about their behavior, something about their performance that's not optimal. And you can use a framework like TP and Soul, like a value system, to very constructively show them where they've stepped out of that um, out of that template. And it's not personal. It's and it's not a surprise because it's so embedded. It's so um, out front. It's so understood that if a person chooses to step out of it, it's not because they don't understand it. It's it's a it's a decision. And it just makes it facilitates a better conversation, and it's not the and hopefully takes away some of the defensiveness when you have to have that kind of um, conversation with someone. So it sounds like you used it pretty actively as a way to frame conversations when people were kind of veering outside. Oh, you could link yeah. them back to remember, 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 and 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 kind of, it was, there's a and there's an implicit um, pact, I suppose, an implicit. Um, you know, it, agreement to be a part of something that, and, and it, and when you sign up for it, you need to, you need to live it. So I think there's, there are some leaders who I think everybody understands culture and says it's important. I think some leaders really intentionally architect and inspire it. Like, um, you were saying, and, and I think some see it as a little bit more of a, I don't know, I think of it sometimes as. It's sort of a second string, you know, kind of lever, a little bit of a luxury, you know, I don't know. We can sort of let it, kind of let it run, you know. What what do you think those leaders are missing? Well, I would say they're missing my definition of, of culture. I mean, I don't, to think of it as a luxury, um, I think that, I said this a minute ago, but I, think about what happens to a, a business that doesn't have it. So um, ask the employees at um, former Twitter how they're feeling right now, or um, some of the big talent agencies that that didn't have didn't have the luxury of of a good culture. I think you, it's easier to see when it, where it doesn't exist. I don't think it's impossible. I don't think it's impossible that a business could be successful with out having. A, a very defined and a very understood culture. It could just, I'm not, I would never, I don't think that's true. But I think if you take a company like that, people always talked about Apple and, you know, the, Steve Jobs was, you know, mercurial and hard and, you know, it, 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 some of the stories in, in those books of his and others now paint a pretty, um, not, not such a positive environment for working. Certainly Apple is not hurting for that. But the thing I always think about when people talk about Apple is, how much better could Apple be if that environment had been as driven and as 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 business, you know, excellence as as they had, if they could have put a more human positive culture around it, how much better could Apple have been? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't. It, I just think it's a provocative question. I I have my, but so if somebody wanted to, um make their culture more intentional, lay it out. How do you think somebody even gets started? Like, what would you say? Okay, here's kind of what you just have to do to get going the first few steps to get your arms around it. Well, I mean, I, I would do, I would do what we did, you know, 30, 25 years ago. I would ask the people in the company, what makes your company, your company? What do you love about your company? How do you how do you define your company? Start with the people who are living it, who are in it. 
because you need them. And if if there if you have you have a staff or you have a company of people that you think are doing a good job and you want to keep them, ask them to define it and ask them to help help figure that out. And that's also I mean that's just a good rule of thumb anyway. Get some skin in the game, you know, get people involved. But when it comes to culture, it just it's not something you can write up yourself. It has to be lived and it has to bubble up from from the from the from the team from the group. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything I haven't asked you <laughs> on this topic that you think is important? Um, no, I, I'm, just, I'm loving that you're asking the question because it's. I will tell you, it's it's much easier for me to talk about culture as as an important business driver today than it was even five or six years ago. And forget it, ten years ago, I believed it my whole career because I've lived it, I've seen it happen, um, I've seen. Um, I've looked around, as I said, I've seen, I can point to companies where the culture is toxic or not healthy. And I see, and you can see business degradation as a, as a part as related to that. Um, but it's, it's, I'm just glad we've gotten to a point where I don't, I, I'm no longer defending myself. <laughs> I'm no longer defending myself that, that the importance of culture is, is a business driver. I think everyone now sees it. And if they don't, you know, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting closer to it being something that's more, um, that's more understood. But I, it's, it's, I love that you asked me to talk about it because, um, that means that, you know, that we're, we're at a place where it's truly can be viewed as a business driver. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking to us about it. It's, um, oh, I got so many nuggets and, um, the, well, <laughs> great stuff, real great stuff. Thank you so much. Doug, thank you so much. I appreciate it. This was fun.